Beethoven is central for so many of us, but for each of us, he's a different person. For me as a player, he's not the symphonies. I have only ever performed one of these in a complete version, number seven, when I was 14, although I have played a number of the arrangements from his time. So my world of Beethoven is what I live with, all the quartets, the string quintets, the string trios, the piano quartets, the piano trios, the violin concerto, the romances, the triple concerto, and absolutely vital for me, the piano violin sonatas. Two things I'd like to begin with. When I was a young musician, it was fairly common to speak of Beethoven as writing against the violin. One famous um, Werner violinist who will remain nameless actually spoke about this in an interview with the BBC Music magazine when they were in the middle of recording the complete cycle of sonatas. And this can seem to have two origins. One was the perception, the popular perception of Beethoven as being entirely a piano orientated composer, which thus enabled such talk. And the second, curiously, was a misapplication of the critic Hanslick's attacks on the Tchaikovsky Violin Concerto, which somehow in some people's minds seems to have transferred into the perceived lack of success of the premiere of Beethoven's Violin Concerto at the beginning of the 19th century, 70 years earlier. The two seem to have molded, um, melded um, Hans Licks. The violin is no longer played, it is yanked about, it is beaten black and blue. Um, seems to have found its way into a perception of how Beethoven approached the instrument. Of course, this is complete nonsense. But the root of it could be this. When Beethoven is writing specifically for the violin in a situation where the violin is being played in the course of rehearsal processes or workshop processes which demand study, as opposed to processes which are determined by sight reading, it should be fairly obvious, particularly in the early 19th century world, the differences. He demands things from the instrument which are not against the violin, but such as the extraordinarily idiomatic yet ferociously difficult beginning of the Kreutzer Sonata that I just played, demand a lot of work. They demand understanding his approach. For me, this is a clue that when he wrote for the violin, when he wrote for the viola, he was writing right from the inside. And that's what this set of three talks is aiming to explore. How can we get inside Beethoven's relationship with the instrument, which from the whole of his life was one with which he had a true, knowledgeable and tactile relationship. But to begin with, we have to confront a little bit of an awkward truth. Most musicians' collaborative activities, and central to what I'm going to talk about, whether it's study or rehearsal, if we can call it that, um, or workshopping, most of these collaborative activities happen behind the closed doors of the rehearsal room, of the salon, working together in a collaboration as new works are forged. These environments are denied to whoever is not in the room. We can only guess. And to a degree, that situation hasn't changed today, except when you have the research approach to the observed rehearsal. So I'm going to begin by focusing on imagining Beethoven's musical world in his birth city, Bonn, until he left it permanently for Vienna in 1792. It's worth pointing out that that means I'm talking about a 13 or 14 year old, uh, for a 13 or 14 pe year period when we know about Beethoven's activities as a successful performer and budding composer. In this environment, of course, at its height for Beethoven, there were the friendships which he would come to enjoy. These I'll get to a bit later, but the obvious ones were going to be with Andreas Romberg, the violinist, and um, Bernard Romberg, the cellist, the flute player Antoine Reicher, or Anton Reicher. Um, and the most important thing to say about 
um, uh, this closed door was all of these musicians that he was around were distinguished improvisers. And this problem, this challenge of focusing and understanding the relationship between notated music and improvising is a substrata to everything I'm going to talk about. So with those three I just mentioned, Andreas, uh, Romberg, Beethoven and Antoine Riker, the three were clearly profoundly affected by the shared experience in the Bonn Court Orchestra of performing Mozart operas under the direction of Anton Riker's uncle, Josef Riker, most particularly the opera Figaro. All of them published sets of variations on the very popular Sei Vol Ballare, uh, um, from that opera within a few years of um, the incredibly important professional performance, the production, which was put on there in 1785. I'm going to juggle around with this a little bit because it helps us establish something of the environment, the, fam the family environment in which Beethoven found himself. Beethoven said he sent to his, in many ways, his first love, Eleanor von Breunig, shortly after his arrival in 1792. And there, it was immediately published by the Artaria Publishing House as Opus One. This two title was very soon ceded, uh, given away, to the first set of piano trios, which were dedicated to Haydn as the Opus One, which we all know today. Um, many reasons behind this, but it's pretty clear that one of the reasons was because Beethoven um, had written this and amongst other works before he left Bonn for Vienna. Uh, the Rombergs published an extraordinarily innovative co-composed set of variations for violin and cello, whilst Anton Riker is for the same duo plus his own instrument, the flute. You can hear both Beethoven's version and the variations by Andreas and Bernard Romberg on the resource page, which I've put, um, you should have a link to. Uh, go to that afterwards. So we don't have time to do that now, but all the music I'm going to talk about, if I'm not playing it, well, is all sitting there. Looking at the various combinations involved, the two, the two, the violin and cello and the flute, and bearing in mind the circumstances under which all of these composer improvisers first encountered this work as performers, it's incredible that, to think that they wouldn't have experimented, messed around with the melody in improvising in the breaks, in, in production. The musicians will do this. And there are simply too many aspects of their respective sets of variations in common for this not to be, at the very least, a possibility or a likelihood. But the only evidence that we ever have or went on in improvising at this time, in many ways, is the publications. Um, we know nothing, or some manuscripts, naturally, of cadenzas, for instance. We know very little of what might have gone on when the players played extempore, as opposed to what they published of in, in improvised um, uh, techniques, as nobody would have thought that was necessary or even desirable to write it down. We have a little bit of a taste. I'd like to play you the beginning of one of um, Andreas Romberg's three um, extraordinary uh, sonatas for violin alone. So this is just the opening and I think you'll see why I'm playing it to you. <laughs> 
think we can safely say that that which I'm not going to make any great claim for it being a profound piece of composition is rather a very good clue of what went on when players played. They made it up. This is the centre of music making at the early 19th century. So that kicks us off to what I'd like to do in this little series of talks, which is to take a deliberately narrow view of Beethoven, seen from the angle or the tailpiece, if you like, of his lifelong relationship with the violin and viola. Beethoven was one of the first composers to note, if only to himself, his concern to preserve a connection to the actuality of string playing. This is revealed in his Dagger book, which he kept from 1812 to 1813. He was clearly worried that the new reality, the new nature of being a composer, beginning to be separate from the world of the performer, ran the risk of distancing himself from gut and horsehair, not to forget, of course, boxwood and brass. It says, Every day, share a meal with someone such as musicians. So when one can discuss this and that instrument, etc., violins, cellos, and so on. I've divided the talks into three. Naturally, there's going to be an overlap of ideas, people, and more. But I think that seeing Beethoven's violin life thus helps, it helps me for certain, to clarify some of the changes that his counterpoint with the violin underwent in the course of his musical life. One of the most extraordinary unities of Beethoven's output is the sheer inventiveness and pragmatism of his work at the violin. I'm going to season these presentations with these illustrations of this, this practicality and inventiveness. There's no point talking about a musician in this as music. Perhaps begin with a long-term result of this practical approach, which he took to everything. An example from the late quartets, which are rightly viewed now just as when they appeared as a summer, a high point of what can be achieved, tried at the extremities of technique, and expression viewed as one. I don't think anyone will have a problem with me saying that in many ways no one had succeeded in going further in pushing these two things simultaneously. Anybody who's played the Grosse Fugue will know what I'm talking about. The challenge for any musician in the early 19th century was a problematic relationship between new realities, new demands from composers, and preparation models which were a greater or to a greater or lesser degree, stuck in the world of the pre-revolutionary capelle. To put it bluntly, the idea of how to practice was being invented almost in real time. Anyone, for instance, who spends any time looking carefully at the manuscripts of the five violin concertos, which Mozart wrote in the mid-70s, will quickly get a sense of how Mozart crafted these works so he could use a limited set of technical procedures to maximum effect. This is not to denigrate him or these extraordinary works, but it gives us a window into how he and his colleagues in the 1770s worked. His father, Leopold, nagged him about spending enough time at the violin as a composer or performer. His response was for a while to write material which didn't reply to demand a lot of practice. This changed, of course, by the time he came to write, for instance, the late E-flat major quintet, or the, the same key string trio, or the last three string quartets. But in Beethoven's case, by the 1820s, when he was clearly not writing violin music for himself, though he was always ready to demonstrate, and that's going to come back later in the talks, um, he nevertheless innovated when endeavoured, when innovating technically for the instrument, to make sure that new techniques could be repurposed so that the player would not find themselves limited to one work, one passage, for instance, a new bowing technique or a new demanding hand position. It's worth saying straight away that there are, if you like, two feeds coming into Beethoven's work. There are, for instance, the things which he might be getting from contemporary players, um, say the, the French school, for instance, in the Opus 59 quartets, you get a lot of this kind of bowing. <laughs> these um, pair, uh, offbeat paired couplet, um, which is, so I didn't do it very well, so um, this kind of thing. In the last group, verbus 59, number one, for instance. On the other hand, there are the techniques which he was innovating, which weren't, if you like, generic, even, so they, the question was, 
does a player want to learn something from a composer they're never going to be using again? It's a question for anybody who works with contemporary composers now, is often asking themselves. So let me illustrate that. The Opus 132 string quartet was completed, workshopped, rehearsed and performed in the late summer and autumn of 1825. Its second movement, Allegro ma non tanto, is an extended minuet. This, this, uh, um. Its trio in A major begins with a justly celebrated duet for the two violins, with the first playing an imitation of a sort of heavenly hurdy-gurdy, or a viel. The passage relies, sorry to get technical, on an extension on the E string, which I can demonstrate now, locking down the C sharp with the first finger and reaching the first invasion to the tonic A with the fourth. An extended hand position. Now, this is not sight readable. You have to know the procedure to play it, but when you know it, well, it's relatively easy. So the hand position, when you're locked into it, gives you this. Now it's worth pointing out at this point that the imitations of similar instruments, say for instance that Mozart uses, are he uses using very generic techniques, not for instance involving complex um, extensions, although simple shifts such as this from the last movement of K218. Now if we fast forward to the summer of 1826, Beethoven was writing his Opus 135 string quartet. And the second movement, again, is a dance movement. But this time a scherzo. In terms of character, it could not be more different from the one from Opus 131 the previous year. Um, but in the B section, the middle section of the movement, Beethoven goes on a rather extended um, excursion from the tonic F major to the submediant A major, which is the key of what I just played and demands one of the most challenging leaping passages for the first violin, this. Um, he uses exactly the same hand position and basic technical structure as the passage we just explored. Of course, he was de he was expecting the same player to play them, Ignaz Schuppenzig, who we're going to be dealing with in the next talk. But I think this shows the kind of creative practicality which had been inculcated in him from his various time playing the violin in Bonn. So it's a good idea, I think, to pull back the curtain just a little and to see what we can learn about what that time was like. It's worth saying that one of the reasons this is not easy is Beethoven himself behaved as if his life began with the arrival, his arrival in Vienna at the, in winter at the end of 1792, this journey across Europe. He never, he didn't operate a kind of scorched earth policy about his past, but there was a degree of repurposing, as I've always mentioned, of pieces written before he left Bonn, implying that they'd been written after he arrived in Vienna in 1793, as if what had happened before hadn't happened. Perhaps the fact that by 1794 um, uh, Bonn had fallen to the French, uh, that might have something to do with it. And of course he never travelled northwest across Europe again, which in itself is extraordinary. It's good to remember that the young Beethoven seems to have enjoyed far more of an early career in the Low Countries than has been realised up to now. There's a note in the ledger of the Orang Nassau court in The Hague. Um, Payroll document. The, this is the court of Prince William of the V. Uh, payroll document, The Hague, November 26, 1783. Invoice for the funded concert, uh, that's the Wegens Gassier de Musique, before His Serene Highness at Court, November the 23rd, 1783. Beethoven, Forte Piano, 12 years, Monsieur Stamets, Alto, Viola. That's Karl Stamets, the son of Johann Stamets. This is one of the earliest accounts that we had of a Beethoven 
on stage present it as an equal to one of Europe's great musicians and offers a tantalising link between the legacy of the Mannheim School of Virtuoso Orchestral and Solo Works and the demands of Beethoven's later works. As we move towards the clearer documentation of Beethoven the collaborator, I think it's important to think about the influence on Beethoven's work of the people he stood alongside and worked with. We know nothing about what impact his concert giving, his alongside Stamets, had on him, because this is the only mention we have of the event. But I think we can be sure of one thing. This was not a solitary event. This was certainly nothing new for him. So I feel like there was a lot more going into the pot. And the second reason for, as I already hinted, for the denial of Bonn, if we can call it this, was completely out of his hands. The year after he, what, a, a year and a half after he arrived in Bonn, um, so this is October 1794, arrived in Vienna, I'm saying, a year and a half after he arrived in Vienna, um, on October 6, 1794, that's Beethoven's birth city fell to the French, and the sovereign state of the electorate and archbishopric, archbishopric of Cologne, of which Bonn was the capital, ended. And it was not restored at the Congress of Vienna in 1815, but handed to Prussia. The fall of the city meant the dissolution of the amazing electoral orchestra, which had been the centre of Beethoven's musical life until he was 21. The end of a tradition. So we have to look very carefully and use our imaginations to get a feel for Beethoven's early life, especially at the violin. When, in 1840, Gerhard von Breunig published his Aus den Schwarz Spanier Hauser, which was translated, by the way, by Maynard Solomon, who died um, last week, he included a glimpse. Well, my father, and that's Stefan von Breunig, um, did stay repeatedly, and he played the violin correctly, though not perfectly all his life, and was a judge of violinist, was that as a youngster, Ludwig soon became a tremendous pianist, but never had any purity of tone on the fiddle, nor any outstanding ability on it. He was always likely to play out of tune, even before his hearing began to be affected. Beethoven's dearest and best friend, as he described him, Dr. Franz Gerhard Wegler, and just note the Gerhard, we're going to, there's a reason for that, wrote that as Beethoven's home life, fame, obviously his father was an abusive alcoholic, deteriorated, um, the Hofbrechtin, that's the elector's uh, wife, Elena von Breunig, um, Elena's mother, soon became a second mother to him. The Hofbrechtin, Helen von Breunig, Eleanor von Breunig's mother, who I've already mentioned, became a second mother to him. And Eleanor is Stefan's sister. In many ways, she exercised a moderating influence on the occasionally hot-headed obstinacy of his character, a lasting bond of friendship was established between the children and Beethoven. If you look in the resource page, you'll see there's a picture of the whole Breunig family there. Ellen, who was the widow of Count Count's court councillor von Breunig, lived in a big house on Munsterplatz, Bonn. Wegler noted that before the war, that's up before 1794, that's when it bomb, this was a prosperous household. So it's easy to understand that it was here that Beethoven experienced the first happy discoveries of his youth, and he was soon treated as a son of the house. Not only did he spend the greater part of his day here, but sometimes the night, and here he received his first introduction to German literature, particularly poetry. And it's worth saying about Beethoven that I would argue that perhaps he's the first major composer for whom the impact of the broadest range of literature available, contemporary literature available at the time, can be found and felt in his music and reflected in his music. And it's worth saying that not only was it literature, that he, of course there was a university in Bonn as he was able in his mid-teens to take advantage, along with Antoine Riker, of the philosophy and science lectures which were available at the university. As a member of the Court Capelle, he was able to go and see these lectures. Now back to Gerhard von Breunig's account, the, which I began with just there. During his joint lessons with Franz Ries, Beethoven played on an instrument from the Schwarzwald region, that's the Black Forest region, which he presented to my father, so that Gerhard von Breunig was Stefan's um, von Breunig's son, uh, at the end of a course of instructions in Memento, and which I keep as a precious keepsake. It was, and alongside this was Fiorillo's Caprices. On the title page was a picture of a little man playing the violin. Later, Beethoven in his capricious way said to my father, this little man 
He is far too small to master such exercises. Now the joint lessons were the lessons which Beethoven and Gerhard's father Stefan took with Franz Ries, whose son Ferdinand would later become Beethoven's piano student in Vienna. I think it's worth just taking a moment here to kind of just go to just if I just play you the last of the Fiorillo Luca Priestess, which in some ways is the simplest. It's he Fiorillo begin began his ended his Caprices in the same way and simpler though because that's earlier that Pagani would begin his 50 years later. <laughs> Not so long ago, when I was just fiddling with that in a hotel room, which I was sharing with my son, who is, is not, he knows his way around the violin repertoire pretty well, he said, why are you playing that piece that sounds like Locatelli? And that's obviously a good point, that you can draw a line f through that particular sound, the Locatelli sound, into Fiorillo, and then it finds its way naturally into the 19th century in a variety of different ways. But it's fascinating to think that Beethoven probably played that if he'd studied the Fiorillo Caprices in an organised way. Now, um, Franz Ries, his teacher at this time, his son, Ferdinand, would later become Beethoven's piano sonata in Vienna, repaying the debt of the lessons Beethoven could never afford. As Haydn noted in his letter later to the aggrieved and aggravated Elector Maximilian in France after Beethoven arrived in Vienna in 1792-93, Beethoven was always short of money and bad with money. So in a similar way, Stefan Breunig, who shared those lessons um, uh, with Beethoven, um, later required that he repay the debt of friendship of the kindness which his, his mother had shown to Beethoven not in a, uh, in a very simple way. Um, at the end of uh, uh, Beethoven's life, um, his son, Gerhard, came to live um, at the end of his life, um, Eleanor's son, Gerhard, came to live with Beethoven and attended to him on his deathbed. Now his relationship, Beethoven's relationship with Eleanor, was confused and it's pretty clear that she saw him as a sibling, whereas he, not surprising, imagined something more. She became a distant ideal for him and of course would become the central, reimagined, womanly ideal of Fidelio, originally named for her, Leonora. Beethoven was always in and out of love, often with a number of women at the same time, so she may have been glad of the distance which the long war imposed between them. For in 1802, she had married Beethoven's closest friend, as he described in Wegler. Gerhard was their son, and he must have seen like the son that Beethoven never had the chance to have. A note that Eleanor penned to her young friend as he left for Vienna in 1792 draws my attention to the littering conversations and banter of the Munsterplatz house. In the Sternbuch, 
which a number of his admirers put together on his departure from Bonn in November 1792, she wrote a quote from Johann Gottfried Herder's Zerstreute Blätter, Strewn Leaves. This was the newest thing. The volume she quoted from was only published that year. She wrote, Friendship with one who is good grows like the evening shadows until the sun of life sets, your true friend, etc. Now, Beethoven's communications with her were far from being so respectful. A year later, he sent the dedicated variation, Savor Ballare, which I mentioned earlier, to her with a note. Accept this trifle and realise that it comes from a friend who holds you in high esteem. Oh, if it only gives you pleasure, then I'm fully rewarded. I add a request that I may be lucky enough to possess again a new waistcoat worked from you in yellow angora. I still have the first one, which you were kind enough to give me in Bonn, but is now so out of fashion that I can only keep it in my wardrobe as a precious gift from you. P.S. The variations will be somewhat difficult to play, especially the trills in the coda. Don't let that alarm you. It's so arranged that you only need play the shake. The other notes you can leave out as they are also in the violin part. I'm not sure Eleanor would have appreciated this very heavy-handed joke. The yellow waistcoat was a distinct not to mention the insult to a piano playing, for the yellow waistcoat was the distinctive apparel of Goethe's suicidal hero, hero of his 1774 novel, The Sorrows of Werther. And Beethoven clearly cast himself as the suicidal hero, much as, interestingly, Bart Brahms would, when he sent an instruction to Simrock with the manuscript of the C minor piano quartet, with the idea that he should be depicted on the front cover of that public, the first publication wearing a yellow waistcoat with two guns to his head. In Brahms's case, he perhaps more accurately had and posited Clara Schumann as Lottie from the book, um, whereas Eleanor, I suspect, was rather less likely or um, happy with being um, uh, perceived as being the rather matronly Lottie with whom um, Werther falls hopelessly in love. But let's just talk back, go back to teachers. If we line up Beethoven's fiddle teachers in Bonn and Vienna, Ries was not the first. Here's a sequence as we know it. Rovantini, violin and viola, 1779 to 1781. Franz Ries, as we just mentioned, that's 1785 to 1786. Then in Vienna, Ignaz von Schubensick, 1794. And that is continued, as I'm going to talk about in the next talk, to a greater or lesser degree into a different relationship and Krompholz in 1795 also in Vienna. The first of these, Franz Rovantini, is to put it mildly a rather mysterious figure about whom nothing is known um, save for the fact that he became very young leader of the electoral orchestra and was dead by the time Beethoven reached 11, which at which point Franz Ries took the place. Um, in his Geschichte des Willenspiels, Andreas Moser noted that and Roventini should be considered as another pupil grandchild of Tartini. That's worth just hovering on a moment because, as we've talked about a little before, if you think about the centre of Tartini's work, it's this idea of um, per ben suonare bisogna ben cantare, in order to play well you should sing well. And that was um, a message that Tartini's dictum had started to burn brighter and brighter at the end of the 18th century. And along that, with the popularity of works such as his very lyrical Didoni Abandonate, his violin depiction of Dido um, abandoned in Carthage. of Beethoven's mother also noted that Roventini was so exceptionally good. Um, he could play beautifully. The other reason that Moser, Andreas Moser, noted that Roventini was another descendant of Tartini in this context was the presence of the first important violinist to be associated with Beethoven, Caiono Mattioli, who, according to Gottlob Neef in 1783, another of Beethoven's teacher since 1779, had been appointed leader and music, then musical director in Bonn in 1774 and 1777, respectively. 
it seems that Rofatini moves into the leader's position on the second date, running up to his death four years later. Neef noted um, in 1783 that Mattioli, quote, and this is important, penetrates quickly into the intentions of the composer and knows how to introduce to convey them clearly and promptly to the whole orchestra. He was the first to introduce accentuation, instrumental declamation, careful attention to fortepiano, or to all the degrees of light and shade in the orchestra of this place. His bowing is very varied. Sein Bogen is a manigfaltig. Here's where we sell something useful, a place to pause and think. Niefer wrote this in 1783, when Beethoven was 12 and making a considerable impact at the electoral court as a young musician of genius, already spoken of as a second Mozart. If there's one thing that we can say is distinctive about Beethoven's innovation as a composer for strings, wind and keyboard, it is and would be the precise demands of accentuation, instrumental declamation, careful attention to forte piano. These, as Neve pointed out, were unique, new in playing at the time. Um, whether or not um, Beethoven had the opportunity to study with Mattioli, he heard him and performed alongside him. There's something there. Um, let me demonstrate. This month, the three Opus 30 sonatas are much on my mind. And for me, as so many musicians, there's one thing that stands out in studying Beethoven seriously. It's this thing which Nifa notes about Mattioli. Accentuation, instrumental declamation, careful attention of all the degrees of light and shade. Let me just play the beginning of the slow movement of the Opus 30 number one. And I'll slightly exaggerate the dynamics and declamation, if we can call it that, that Beethoven asks, uh, asks for. It's worth mentioning that he marks this multa espressivo. And in the 20th century, we came to simply come def define espressivo as in a thing in itself, as opposed to asking the question which a rhetorician would ask, what is being expressed and how do you express it? Etc. Now, of course, in the middle of that was the control of one particular dynamic, um, which for me, as so many musicians, was the thing which stands out in st when we studied Beethoven seriously for the first time. Um, Beethoven's love of precise, initially, what seemed to be um, counterintuitive um, subito, um, subito dynamics, particularly subito piani. So if I go to the most celebrated of that group of sonatas, the Opus 30, number three, which is very much going to be the centre of our talk um, next week, the first talk next week. Everybody, you know, recognises, if you're a violinist, this... Um that one. Which seems such a huge challenge when you're young. And somebody once said to me that, imagine if Beethoven had long enough, lived long enough to see... Uh, a German um, steam train, which he of course didn't. Um, if he lived in the UK, he would have done. Um, uh, he would be the kind of person who, like the unfortunate uh, M. P. Huskinson, who was killed uh, famously at the uh, opening of the Liverpool Manchester Row in 30, 1830, didn't realise that you effectively couldn't stand in the middle of the track and say stop and expect the train to stop. Um, uh, and that is an extraordinary challenge um, to begin with. I think in order to get a handle, to find our way into, say, a teaching room of the past, it's important that we examine our own experiences of collaboration and pedagogy, however anachronistic they might seem. Um, two things could happen. We're either going to learn something which is useful, or we're going to lose something, learn something which is not useful. Either way, we might learn something and give ourselves a better understanding of past models.
after all, at its most basic, um, teaching is about communication, and communication is communication. Like so many people, this sonata was far from being the first Beethoven sonata I'd studied. Like nearly every other violinist I'd begun with. <laughs> The Spring Sonata, uh, a title, but by the way, which Beethoven did, uh, did never appended to it. If I think about my work on the Opus 30 Sonatas with the great and very much lamented Ralph Holmes when I was 14, it offers me, me some insight into Beethoven's relationship with his teachers, just as any of our your teacher people interchanges in any field, whether they're music or not, can open windows of enlightenment to the past. When we started working on the G Major Sonata, um, my lessons seemed changed. It seemed as if the teacher-pupil dynamic shifted. Um, Ralph worked on my exploration of this piece as if he was preparing it himself, which was partially true as it was the one of the ten piano violin sonatas that he performed the most. Tragically, he never had the opportunity to record the whole cycle, which I regard as a huge loss to violin playing. In these lessons, Ralph confronted me, and we have two models going at the same time here. One is thinking about remembering what comes from the experience of working with a great player, um, and the other is um, someone opening the door onto Beethoven himself. So it's I appreciate this is muddled. Ralph confronted me with the seemingly impossible demands that Beethoven makes on us as players, which are nothing to do with right notes and everything to do with honesty, the uncompromising dis delivery of the expressive markings, the shape and colours, which are the essence of his scores. What I began with, the Kreutzer Sonata, um, is a great example of that. He doesn't just write those notes, he writes forte, <laughs> diminuendo piano, <laughs> the next phrase, crescendo, <laughs> sorsando piano, <laughs> again this next phrase, Crescendo, sorsando piano, crescendo, 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 sorsando piano. Which is an extreme example of what I'm talking about. And Beethoven uses the um, subito piano in the G major sonata more than practically any other work. At that time, Ralph was playing mostly with the pianist Jeffrey Prattley, and Jeff came into many of my lessons and played with me, except when Ralph pushed me away from the stand, which was a lot. And the greatest strength of his teaching was he taught by doing, not showing, which is different. And that, bear in mind that um, when Beethoven was studying with Franz Ries, he was studying with a young man. Um, uh, I suspect that the teaching had some of that element. He was a very much an active player, he was not if you like, a teacher showing what to do by saying do it, s demonstrating how something should be played, rather playing it. I remember a review of a teacher many years ago saying he doesn't so much play as demonstrate how something should be played, and it was not a compliment. These sessions infected me with the excitement of meeting Beethoven's demands, finding the life in every note, every gesture. The reason I've been going on so much about this is I suspect that the encounter with Mattioli, about which you know almost nothing, um, as a musician, a senior collaborator, because of course he was the leader, and then the director of the orchestra with which the young Beethoven would very rapidly find himself playing concertos before he joined the orchestra, um, after Mattioli left. So his this encounter with Mattioli as musician, collaborator, and possibly mentor, clearly left its mark on the expressive demands, which became central very soon to the young composer's musical language, but they're not there in the Bonn works which we have. When Mattioli left the Electoral Capel in 1784, there was much discussion as to who might replace him, and the name of Mozart was seriously mentioned, and it would have been possible. But it was the cellist composer Josef Reicher, the Bohemian, who took his place, which set in motion the beginnings of what I consider the crucial relationship for the young Beethoven and right through his life, the much un undersung and underappreciated relationship with um, uh, Anton Reicher, who was perhaps the only person who was ever able to stand up to Beethoven as a colleague and a friend. So if we get back to the very limited information that we have about the joint lessons that Beethoven shared with von Bronig, uh, 
under the tutelage of Franz Ries. I think it's a good idea to begin with music. Um, it's difficult for us from this distance not to see Franz Ries as the um, grand seigneur of the dynasty leading through his son Ferdinand and on to Hubert Ries. Um, this here is the first edition of a set of violin studies um, which Hubert Ries would who became the chamber musician to the Prussian king, who ironically ended up um, uh, in, ch uh, in, in charge of the uh, electorate of Bonn after it had been ceded in 1815. Now, when Beethoven came to study with Franz Ries, Franz Ries had just turned 30. He was um, uh, spoken of as the best violinist for solos and for excellent performances. Merza noted that already as a teenager, he was renowned as a chamber musician, and this was only heightened when he became the leader of the orchestra under Josef Reicher and later Kapellmeister. Now, Ries was the violin student of Johann Peter Salomon, um, born, born and raised, and the connections with Beethoven get charmingly tangled at this point, as Salomon, of course, is so important for us in the UK. Um, uh, was born in Bongasse Zwanzig, 20 Bongasse, the very house where, in 25 years later, Beethoven would be born. And uh, as Beethoven was driving southeast to uh, Vienna in 1792, you could argue that Salomon was pulling Vienna to the northwest. In 1791, he had brought Haydn to London. And en route, the two stopped at Salomon's hometown, Bonn, were generously received by the elector which is when Beethoven met him for the first time. In 1792, it's just as likely that Beethoven would have gone to London to work with Salomon. There was an invitation and it was being considered very seriously. A note from Beethoven's Stammbuch included the following verse. See, O friend, Albion calls you. See the shady grove which entices the singer. Hasten them without delay over the surging waves. Imagine that. Imagine if instead of going to Vienna, Beethoven had gone to, in some ways, uh, the equally exciting uh, musical environment of London. Um, uh, of course, later, curiously, it was London was going to have an enormous impact on him because if you think about it, Zalaman's, the work, innovations on Zalaman, of Zalaman in London, which built on what uh, Carl Friedrich Abel and uh, Johann Christian Bach had done with their concert in the mid-1760s. The two things together then led to the founding of the Philharmonic Society in London in 1813, which of course became such a crucial impact and influence on Beethoven and a help for Beethoven after the visit of George Grove to um, Vienna in the uh, early 18-teens. And later, for instance, they sent Beethoven his first Broadwood piano, which effectively introduced him to modern piano writing and famously commissioned the Ninth Symphony. But for me, the crucial place and the crucial influence on the young Beethoven's violin lessons would have been Paris. Not for nothing did Ries share the same birth year as Giovanni Battista Viotti. And Viotti, of course, of 1755, Viotti was the greatest disciple, if you like, of Tartini, who I've already um, uh, mentioned and held his dictum about singing and playing as absolutely vital. From the moment this brilliant 25-year-old arrived in Paris, his influence and the idealism of his playing and teaching was felt across Europe. Even Mozart arranged one of his concertos. And I think this is where it's a good idea to pivot to the message which is to be found on the cover of um, the Fiorello Caprices. And you, if you'll see, it's sitting there on the resource page. Beethoven made a remark to Breunig. This little man is far too small to master such difficult exercises. The most important thing to notice about this cover is that it shows a child. Beethoven was the first, one of the first generation musicians to be taught by teachers using musical material, teaching ideas which were specifically aimed for and crafted for young people. I think it's worth noting that I'm not referring to the abusive um, physically and verb and mentally abusive methods by which Beethoven's father, if we can call it that, instructed him. But the generation of educators, and we can begin to truly use this word at this point, and these who had actually studied and were developing the teaching of the young. 
The edition of Fiorillo, which Beethoven and Browning were laughing about, is one published by Offenbach and Company. Um, probably a pirated edition, actually, but, but that happened all the time. It shows a boy comfortably dressed in loose-fitting clothes, which today we would describe as being play clothes. He's, and this is crucial, happily playing the violin outside on the grass in a rural, sylvan, pastoral scene near a charming country cottage. Remind ourselves that the 1770s to the 1790s were the age which introduced the use of the word natural to the language in the way we now, now understand it and introduced the idea of being outside to something which was good for you when William Wilberforce would um, surprise and shock his servants by insisting on sitting on the ground when engravings in Paris showed people playing badminton outside on the grass um, uh, in, in the parks and woods around Paris. This image is the very epitome of idealised late enlightened education. This was the world flowing from Rousseau of Stephanie de Genlis and Mariah Edgeworth. Central to the teaching ideas which had flowered from the expl quite explosive response to the publication of Rousseau's, Rousseau's Emile in 1763 was an interchange between playing and learning. By way of illustration, one of the methods which Stephanie de Genlis, who would later become Napoleon's Minister for Education, and was much admired by Viotti and the, the circle he spent time with in England, the Chinnery family. In fact, Margaret Chinnery was painted by Elizabeth Vigie Le Brun, the greatest portraitist of the age. Uh, her portrait shows her holding the manuscript of one of Jean Genlis's educational works. Um, Jean Genlis's central idea and this sounds modern even today, and it's not something which certain government ministers will understand, was that children would be rewarded for playing, and playing in the true sense, for playing well by rewarded with lessons. Um, and it's worth noting, and I'm sorry it took me a moment to get around to this, that Viotti, both in France and England, resisted teaching adults. His disciples rode Kreutzer and Bio had not studied with him in the way that he taught children. Um, they'd come under his influence when they were employed to play in the orchestra of the Théâtre Le Monsieur, which he was one of the co-founders of, um, who was the musical director of in the 1780s, and that theatre later morphed into the very famous Fédor Theatre. And so effectively they were taught by being under his benevolent violin bow, if you like. But the children he taught, Nicholas Mori most famously, and Libon, less known as Robrex, had a very different experience. It's worth saying that Nicholas Mori, of course, would go on to become the most influential um, violinist in the UK in the term 1820s and 1830s, because as well as his work as an orchestral leader, he was the first professor of violin, senior professor of violin, at the newly founded Royal Academy of Music after it was founded in 18, uh, 20, 1822 alongside Spagnoletti. And if you read uh, Viotti's letters both to um, Maury's parents and to the people who, the family, the Chinnery family who supervised him, he is very involved in the minutiae of every aspect of his education from um, his concern, for instance, that he was being fed incorrectly by his parents for too much. Uh, there is a letter talking about um, reading, eating too much spaghetti. Remember that um, uh, Viotti himself was I Italian, although he effectively became naturalized French and then British, born a blacksmith's son in Fontanetta di Po in 1755. And alongside that, of course, uh, Viotti wrote in his letters, letters to Maury, very kind letters, um, checking that he was playing well. This wasn't the violin, enjoying playing, playing with toys. In fact, in some ways, playing with toys at all was invented at this time and was seen as very much part of um, a pedagogical process. And he was reading big books and the language of reading big books talk about this as being, dare I use the word, fun. My sense from um, 
the to and fro between Stefan and uh, von Bronig and Beethoven uh, later in life was that the shared lessons with Bronig under Ries may have had something of the nature of this idealized, dare I call it, a true pedagogy, the leading of children, which the late Enlightenment idealized. Um, but I'd like to just pivot back to another idea of Beethoven as an innovator on the instrument at the same time as being somebody who innovated from a deep knowledge of its history. Um, if I slow down the end of the first movement of the Opus 131 quartet, which I mentioned earlier, we get this. We have this is the coda. It's worth noting that um, the fingering on that, which is not marked, is indicated through notation. So there are two, if you like, contrary things going on there at the same time. Um, one is what you might say is a very contemporary, clangorous use of a combination of octave writing and um, uh, dissonant intervals in order to to make power this kind of uh, you know that is looking right towards um, the 20th century but at the same time there's a knowledge and a sympathy with something which is more of the early 18th century with the notation of the last nine makes me suspect something. We know that editions and copies of um, Bach's sonatas and partitas were drifting around prior to the earliest known publication, which is in 1800. But it's interesting just to point out that Beethoven there in a string quartet um, is doing something which, for instance, Mozart never asks for in the quartet. So there's a possibility that Mozart asks for bariolage in certain moments in his concertos. But I kind of doubt it because the next line... But there it is. But Beethoven's here... is very close to... the prelude from the E major partita. Now, before you um, jump on me and say um, this is nonsense, it's worth remembering that Cartier's um, La Deville Long, which predates this period, included at its very last piece, a last example of the three volumes is And this clearly made an impact because, um, one, we know that um, uh, Bayo included in his La de Villon, and, and this is what will, will point me towards I'm going, what I'm going to talk about in the last of the talks, that the copies of that fugue were circulating in London. It's difficult not to play at the beginning of this um, without thinking about a relationship to Bach. And it's worth noting that the original dedicatee of the Kreutzer Sonata, and I will talk about this in some depth, um, George Augustin Polgrin Bridgetower, in the beginning of the uh, 1800s, was involved in an argument with um, Samuel Wesley as to who were, had their Samistat copy of that C major fugue from the Third Sonata. Beethoven is at very least showing us that he's able to find a way into the future by, if you like, dwelling in the past. This, and it's the past of the minutiae of string playing. This is innovation through deep knowledge, not 
through confronting the reality of the violin. This is never music against the instrument. In October 1801, the young pianist and composer Ferdinand Ries arrived in Vienna. Um, he'd come to study the piano intensively with the composer, and like Beethoven, he also went on to study counterpoint with Albrechtsberger. Now, this, of course, was the repayment of a debt. It was Ferdinand's father, Franz, who had been talking about giving violin lessons to Beethoven and Bonn, and it's, as I suggested, very likely that Beethoven had had no way to pay for those lessons. Um, there was clearly been a long-standing understanding long st that Beethoven should reciprocate in some way. When I went to study with, in Boston with Louis Krasner, who I always talk about far too much, and I didn't have money to pay for him, he looked me in the eye, calculated how much money I owed him, and then said, you have to do this for somebody else in 60 years' time. It happens a lot with teaching. Now, Ferdinand performed Beethoven's fourth piano concerto on the 4th of August, 1804, to the great delight of his teaching. 1803, Ries described his lessons with Beethoven to the Bonn publish, Nicholas Simrock. Beethoven takes more trouble with me than I could have believed. Each week I receive three lessons, usually from 1 o'clock to 2.30. Now that's very interesting. I wonder if that, I and mean, this is incredibly rare, and perhaps that gives us a clue as to how Beethoven himself had been taught earlier. So he's giving Ferdinand Ries um, four and a half hours of lessons a week. I can almost play his Sonata Pathétique, which might give you pleasure because the precision that he demands is hard to imagine. Of course, what we're talking about there is the precision which, if we go with the, um, the creative in a way of approaching this that I'm talking about, a precision which maybe had been first inculcated into him through his, in, in, his encounter with Mattioli, that, that idea um, of precise expression, accentuation, louds and soft, because of course for a pianist of Ferdinand Ries's ability the technique of the pathetique wouldn't have been that challenging. He's talking about something else. But here's the last point. Ferdinand writes, to hear him improvise however may not be imagined. So that's a kind of challenge. Exactly where we started. And that's going to be something which I'm going to return to again and again and again. In Nund, talking about collaboration, whether it is going to be collaboration as teaching, which is what we've been dancing around today in a rather vague way, collaboration as a collaboration of l equals over a long period of time, which is what Mundi's talk is going to be about, or collaboration actually between either very brief explosive friends or complete strangers, there's a crucial thing which needs to be recognised beneath all of this, which is that all of these people that we're talking about were collaborating as improvisers. Improvisation would have been something which found its way into the process both of all of these, and it's pretty clear from that, the nature of that final Fiorillo uh, Caprice that I played, that which encourages improvisation. In fact, a Fiorillo published it with a set of a seven or eight different bowing techniques. These are always treated today as if they are pedagogical things, things to improve your bow hand, but that wasn't the point. These were treated thus in order to give you a greater um, uh, control of language as an improviser, as someone playing preludes. And perhaps the last thing to finish with is that when we are listening to the works that Beethoven and his collaborators, his friends, his rivals, produced, how can this world of improvisation be heard and should it be manifested in the way that we um, present and hear the works that they produced? <laughs>